Okay, so I get to introduce Jeff. Uh, Jeff served as a police officer in California before becoming chief of police, and uh, that's where he first got his that's where he got his first piece of management. And since then, he's worked as a forgery detective, and he eventually began working for Walmart. He switched over to the private sector, and he's now district manager uh, for limited brands over Utah and part of Nevada. And so Jeff lives in Logan, Utah with his wife, Tony, and they have four kids. They have three sons and one daughter. And he enjoys spending time with his family, road biking, and they also have honeybees, which is cool. They have Mr. Honey. And I was introduced to Jeff through a mentoring program that Paul Staples, who owns Paul Staples Real Estate over in Kahuku, uh, heads over. And so through Paul, we get to meet people who are successful in different fields that we're interested in and get to interview them and learn a little bit more about them. And so after Jeff Bruce finishes speaking, Paul Staples is going to get up and say a few words about the mentoring program that he has. So turn the time over to Jeff Bruce. Thank you. So I, can everybody hear me okay? And this is on, I think, right? So I um, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit today. I, uh, I know that uh, whenever you have somebody come as a guest speaker, you just don't know what might happen, right? So I don't have any surprises. I didn't bring anybody extra to come out with me or anything. It's just me. So, um, and I'm really wide open to questions, and I know that we like to save those to the end. But if you have some kind of a burning question that you just have to ask, if you want to just throw up your hand or just stand up and ask, I'd be more than happy to do that. And then we'll have some time afterwards. But uh, I think one of the best parts about this is really having the opportunity to learn. And I feel really honored that uh, I met Paul and then eventually uh, Brother Tanner and everybody invited me to come and, and speak to you today. So hopefully what I can share with you today is just a little bit about what's made my life hard and then easy so that if there's anything that I can impart to you maybe you can miss some of those speed bumps and have a little bit easier leading people because that's really what it's all about is about the people and about leading people to do great things so hopefully I can share that with you today so just to start off I had, had once heard the story of a, um, a gentleman that was going to travel over to Europe and uh, he had a really uh, a great goal he wanted to meet the Pope so he, uh, he set forth on this business plan to get over to Europe and then have the opportunity to meet the Pope. So he went to his local barber to get a haircut before he went. And as he sat down and got his haircut, he told the barber about the plan. And the barber, every time he would say something really exciting about his um, trip to Europe, the barber would say, oh, terrible airline. Oh, terrible hotel. Oh, you're going to meet terrible people. And so the... The guy gets up, he's a little, uh, little skeptical now about his trip, but he takes off and about a month later he returns back to uh, the barber to kind of fill him in. And so the barber was really, you know, with anticipation to find out just how bad his trip was. So he says, well, how, how was the airline? He said, it was great. He said, how were the people? Great. How was the hotel? Great. He said, did you get to see the Pope? He said, I did. He said, what did the Pope say? And he said, the first thing the Pope said is, where did you get that bad haircut? So, um, my, uh, my talk today is leadership really equals influence. And really, it's about your attitude to lead people. And so your attitude will make up at least 90% of how you're able to lead people. And people always follow somebody with a great attitude. And so hopefully, uh, I can share that with you today. So when you think about leadership and your ability to influence people, um, I often start with integrity with people because to me, having true integrity with people breeds trust. And if your people can't trust you as a leader, uh, they won't follow you. And in fact, if you find that you're not leading anybody, you're really out for a walk. You're not really leading people. And so you've got to have that integrity. So if you think of influence and you think of the first letter I, it's really about integrity and how well you can live up to those high ideals. You can link it directly to some of the, the beliefs that we have as um, LDS and as Christian people about doing what's right and having integrity. Um, the N in influence is really about nurturing others. Um, people need to know that you actually care for them 
and what they're up to. So one of the things that I have tried to do as a leader is if I'm interacting with an hourly associate that works for one of my leaders, or if I'm interacting with one of my store managers, I try to know something about each person that I deal with. And you would be surprised the energy and excitement you can get from someone by just remembering a name, remembering that they actually own an animal, or they own a cat or a dog, or they have two roommates that just drive them nuts, right? And so you would be surprised when you see this person again, just asking a question really shows that you care about them. So really nurturing your people is uh, what I find exciting. The F in influence is for faith, because I you have to believe in people and have faith in people. I will say that probably some of the uh, hardest knocks that I've ever had in my leadership career has come because I've had too much faith in people. Um, and I believe truly that people will do what you ask them to do if you have that faith and trust in them. Um, but you also have to be able to know that you've got to have a plan B because sometimes even with the best faith that you may have in someone, Sometimes they may or may not uh, fulfill what you ask, but you've got to have faith and it's got to be legitimate. Um, the L in influence stands for listen. And as I think about listening, um, how good of a listener are you? What type of a listener would you identify yourself? Um, do you sit down to talk with people that you care about or they care about you and do you have to ask them to repeat themselves two or three times? My wife's here, so I'm not going to tell any personal stories, but she will tell you that while I think I'm a good listener at work, I'm a bad listener at home. So, um, but I would, I would say that when your people genuinely think that you believe in them and that you will listen to them, they will do whatever you want them to do. And I, I've learned a phrase a few years ago. It's called, be here now. So wherever you are and in whatever you're engaged in, you've got to be there now to be able to understand your people. And so, no matter what's happening around you, if you're there now for the person, the opportunity to really grow and develop with somebody is going to be there. If you've got your iPhone, you've got your Blackberry, you've got your laptop, you've got everything going on around you, and then you're trying to focus on something critical, you're not there. They know it, and so eventually that person either walks off and finds somebody else that can lead them, or they become either a bad leader because they assume what you do is what they should emulate as a leader. So that's uh, the L for listen. The U in influence stands for understand. You hear some very interesting things as a leader. Um, you hear, I think I've probably heard every reason why something couldn't be done as a leader. Um, but in everything that you're told, you've got to figure out a way to understand where that person may be coming from and what they really want to achieve and if you can't understand, then you're really going to have a hard time figuring out how you're going to drive your business forward. How are you going to be able to deliver on the things that are expected of you if you don't understand? The other key thing about understanding is that a lot of times as a leader, you become the person that the company or your leader wants you to go out and explain something to your people. And there's been a number of times where I've been asked to go in front of a large audience to explain something that's really not positive for the company. And so you've got to be able to, one, understand why you're being asked to do that, and then understand your audience and, and what they are, their understanding will be. So understanding is, is a key thing. And then E in, the, in influence is really about enlarging people. So if you don't spend at least... 50% of your time as a leader growing other people, you'll find out that one day you'll be all alone because nobody can take your place. So you've got to spend 50% of your time growing other people. So you've got to enlarge their understanding. Have you ever worked for or been taught by somebody who doesn't like to share the secrets with you? So whatever they, the information they have is kind of secret and they're afraid that if they tell you how to do it, that you're going to take their job or they're going to they're gonna get the A on the paper uh, because they shared something with you. And the best people that I've ever worked for have told me everything that I needed to know because they weren't afraid that I was going to take their job. They were hoping that I would either get their job, the next job, the higher job, and in many cases have the opportunity 
when you feel like you could say, you know what, I'll probably work for you one day, that's the most liberating thing you can do because then you're no longer worried about secrets that you might have. You want to share with what you have. So it's about enlarging your people. And then the N in influence is really about navigating. Have you ever gone into, uh, well, we came in today, had no idea where this room was. So sure enough, run into Paul. Next thing you know, we get to the right places. Have you ever been asked to do something, but nobody pointed the way for you to get started? And how frustrating that was probably the first hour, days, depending on how big the project was, where you had to come up with stuff to try to figure it out on your own. So how do you really navigate your people? So most people will do whatever you ask if you'll just ask and explain. Um, but I've, I've been in situations where I've been asked to go do things. And they're like, oh, well, I don't really know what you need to do, but you just go over there and do that. Well, I don't know how you do that. And then when you come back, what usually happens is they're upset with what happened because what happened wasn't what they want to happen. So you've got to uh, enlarge your people by filling them in. Um, C in influence is connecting. So I, um, I'm a people person, and I believe that you've got to be able to connect with people before you can actually ask them to do something. Um, I've worked for some people that really didn't care about, uh, aren't cell phones awesome? Somebody's got a cool ring too, so. <laughs> but uh, um, just as you think about like connecting with people, I enjoy learning something about people. And I figure out that if you can learn something about somebody and connect with them, when, it's, when there is uh, an opportunity to do great things, you have a connection and you can call somebody. <laughs> Um, I know Paul will probably talk about how we met, but we met because we both are a people person and we started to talk to each other on an airplane, and then before you know it, there's been a connection for a couple of years, um, and now I'm here. Or um, there's just a connection that you should make with people, and if you feel disconnected from your leader, then we have to ask yourself, are you truly listening to them, or are they not listening to you, and try to figure out how to better connect with them. And then E. I don't necessarily like this word because I think empowering others, E stands for empower, but you have the ability and the capabilities to do whatever you want to do. And I can be, uh, I guess, a, come right on in. I can be a spokesman for that. We have their instruments too, so. I can be a spokesman for, I guess, being whatever you want to be. I never realized that um, at this stage of my life that I would be working for limited brands. Um, I started my career out as a police officer. I never realized. Um, but if you have the will to do what you want, you have that connection and you have that influence, you can do whatever it is you want to do. And whenever anybody says to me, well, I just can't do that, or I'm, I'm too old, I'm too young, they don't, you know, I'm from this place or that place, I always question that because I truly believe, and maybe that's because I have a wide open perspective of the world, but you can do whatever you want to do, and you can be successful at it, and it really just depends on you. There's a lot of influence uh, in the world, but you're the one that has the main influence. So that's how I kind of define the leadership. So I want to um, kind of share with you what I, I kind of thought was just some interesting um, things as it comes to influencing people. Um, leaders always have to pay a price for leadership. How many of you have ever thought, I just want to be the captain of the team, but it would be kind of cool if I didn't have to practice, right? So we all want to be the leader. We want to be the boss until we find out that really, because what's, what were we told in the, the business world is that all the bad stuff always rolls downhill, right? So you want to be the number one boss because if you're the number six boss, you're the one that's going to catch everything as it comes down, right? So you've got to be willing to pay the price as a leader. And so if you want to be a great leader, there's a lot of things that you have to do to get to be a great leader. You can't walk into a room without trust with people, without empowering people, without connecting with people and saying, I'm the leader. It's time for us to go. Most people won't follow you. So there's, there's a price to be paid. So I, I kind of listed in my mind, have you ever worked for somebody who thought they were a number one leader, but really they were like the number five leader? A number five leader, and if we could put it on a scale of one to 10, if you were a poor leader and you were a number eight, let's say eight or 10 is the worst, and so you were kind of a bad leader, you could never, as a bad leader, grow 
people further than you. Have you ever noticed that as bad leaders lead, they continue to grow bad people that get to about that level eight? And as I've worked with some people, most people that work for bad leaders will leave and go somewhere else where they can find that opportunity to be a great leader. And so as I look at my career, I've worked with some amazing people, and I've worked with some people who I thought were crazy. And so I, I'm just wondering how the connection has been made in my life as I've moved throughout my career. And so I can think where I'm, in, where I'm at today is because of great leaders that I've worked with in my life, because people start to connect in the business world, and they start to establish who their teams are or who they know will do the right thing at all times. And then when they get to positions of leadership, they start to go out and find those people that they've met along the way who they can truly trust. And so I think about today, I'm where I'm at today because I work for a great director who always said, I want you on my team no matter where I go. And so when he went to a place, wasn't long, the phone rang and said, I need you, here's what I will do for you. And those are the kind of connections that you make as you really strive to have integrity and to try to have that connection with people. And what I have found also is you can totally translate what we know in the gospel to how it is to lead people. And so while you may, not, while you may quote um, a scripture out of the New Testament or you may quote something out of the Book of Mormon and may not say where it came from, guaranteed that half of uh, the, your audience that you're leading who may have never heard that before will think that you just delivered some type of wisdom that they're like, where did you get this stuff? And it's like, well, if you look at great leaders in time, they're the ones who have really set the pace. And so I think we have some great examples that, to follow for that. Um, the next thing is uh, I had listened, I had heard a story one time about a kind of a heavier set guy who thought he was a great leader. And when he got up on the scale, the scale only went to 75 pounds. And some kid standing next to him said, well, that guy must be really hollow. And so I, I thought about that story, and I thought about how does it relate to leadership? Sometimes if we're not a complete leader and we're hollow inside, our people can see it, right? The big guy's on the scale, and he sees 75 pounds, and he thinks, I am at my perfect weight. But the people next to him are saying, well, that guy, the reason he's at that perfect weight is because there's nothing of substance within him. And so if you think about how to be successful as a leader, you've got to have the conviction to be able to learn and grow and do things that really stretch your mind and stretch your presence amongst people. Um, I, uh, I kind of break it into leaders that develop leaders and leaders that develop followers. So leaders that develop leaders are people that want to be succeeded. So I spend probably eight to 12 hours a month on succession planning. And so what that is, is I sit down and I have everyone that works directly for me. And then I try to list at least three individuals that could take their place. And we call that three deep leadership. leadership. And what we ask is, is if this person was promoted or if this person found a great opportunity somewhere else, do we have three high quality individuals that could take their place and that we could make the transition within days rather than months? And I'm always concerned about a company who will call, and recruiters love to call, and as you get out of school, people will be calling you and want to give you these jobs. And one of the first questions I like to ask is, how long has the job been open? Because if they tell you that they've been searching for the right candidate for a year, that means they don't have any succession planning within their company to fill that spot immediately. Because if they're not able to do it internally, or if they tell you it's been open a year because we want somebody from the outside, you should think through what they're really telling you is they're not developing their people. They're looking for these people to come in and add these new ideas and probably shake things up, which is, uh, can create a lot of problems for you as a leader. So I spend a lot of time in the month developing this plan. And then I expect my leaders to do the same with their people. And so we've set some really strict goals uh, in my leadership team that says that if you have an opening, that within 15 days, it's got to be filled. You've got to have the right person in place within 15 days. And what that allows us to do then is to interview those three people that we believe in, 
as well as any other candidates that might be um, of interest, and then make a decision and move forward. And so what that does is that really forces us as leaders to develop people. So if you want to list three people, you've got to be able to share what have you done to make them a better leader. Um, you can't just put names on there. And I've, I've been involved and I've done it myself where I'm like, this is an awesome person. I'm just going to put them on the list. And then sure enough, an opening happens. And now you're like, oh, I'm going to just, OK, you've got, the, you've got the job without developing them. And then found out uh, just how poorly that ends. Because generally, people who aren't supported or who aren't led by a good leader, they leave within 90 days of a job. And we, we closely monitor uh, turnover because you can directly link problems within your business to how well your leaders are leading their people. People are, are, you hate to say it, but in the retail world, when people are unhappy, when people have a, a bad leader, there's no excuse for it, but people tend to steal. People tend to just say, ah, it's not my money, I don't care. Or I don't care about the company. If I lose my keys to the, to the store, that's OK. I don't care about the company. People are more apt to take that attitude when they work for somebody who's a really poor leader. So we do a lot of uh, succession planning to try to ensure that we have the right people in place. The next thing we do is leaders who develop leaders really focus on the strengths. Has, have you ever had anybody tell you that you're not very good at something and we're going to try to fix you? Right? So, and there's probably a thousand books out that you could read at the bookstore about identifying your weakness and then we're going to put together a development plan to make you awesome at your weakness. Well, I can tell you that I have a number of weaknesses and I've worked for people that try to fix them and they're not fixed today and they will never be fixed. And so you've got to focus, leaders who develop leaders focus on strengths of people. So what is it about this person that makes them an amazing leader? And then how do you develop that and turn them loose? Because guaranteed, somebody that can go after what they truly love and believe in will be more successful than the person way back here that's trying to change that weakness that they have. So I can tell you that I love to be creative and think of the idea. And I love to, to get the team ready. But I'm not an analytical person. So I don't want to go sit out on the table and like hash out every detail. I tell the team, this is where we want to go. Here's the expectations. You fill in the middle. And here's the results I expect. And so for years, I had a boss that wanted me to be just in the box, detail oriented. Well, I, I can't do that. It, I got, I get nervous. I start thinking about, you know, how am I going to deliver that? So we go find somebody that's really analytical, who that's their strength. They love it. And then we find the creative person who just loves being with people. And you match those people up. And it's a team that can't be stopped. But if you try to get a team together to work on all weaknesses, you'll find that the team will never, never, I believe, will be successful. The next thing is leaders who develop leaders spend time with the top 20% of the people that work for them. And the leaders who develop followers always spend the time with the bottom 20%. And so that was a hard um, thing for me to learn as a leader. Because unfortunately, most of you, as you enter into the business world, will find that there is a, quote, ranking system of who, how well you perform your role. Um, there are meetings where people will sit down and they talk about what are the strengths of your people, what are the weaknesses of your people, um, what are the pro promotability. And so you find that as you are developing leaders, you want to spend the time with those top 20% of people that you know will be very successful. And so what you find is as you spend more time with the top 20, you start bringing more and more great people into the organization. But as you spend more of your time with the bottom 20, you'll find that your view of the organization gets bad. Because then all you see is the people that probably really shouldn't be working there. But now you're down here in the 20% all the time. And what do the 20% usually bring you? They're late to work all the time. They miss their assignments. They, uh, all of a sudden, they have an emergency and they have to leave, but yet they haven't layered in any kind of a plan to cover while they're gone. All these things, or they make um, the, the bottom 20 usually are the ones that make the poor comments to the, uh, to the associates or to the team who then feel it's necessary to call somebody in human resources because either what they've said is inappropriate or they've uh, done something against the law 
firing people, they, all these things happen. So if you can think about spending your time with the top 20% and growing and developing them, the top 20 always attracts more top 20. And pretty soon you have an organization where you're really battling over who's in the top 20 because your entire group is really a top 20 performers. Um, the next thing is that leaders um, really have, leaders that develop leaders are great leaders. They have abilities that make them good leaders, but leaders who develop followers are just good leaders. You just kind of so-so, people will follow you, you pretty much get the results, but great leaders develop people that really recognize their abilities and that are really excited about being a leader. And there's no, nothing more exciting than being in a leadership position where everything comes together and you feel so great about what you've been able to deliver from a profit and loss or from a team that, that comes together and puts together your project. There's nothing better or a greater feeling than feeling that success. And then there's nothing worse than leading a group of followers, if you're a good leader, and then getting to a kind of a bad place and turning around and finding everybody looking at you. Like, hey, well, what are we gonna do, right? Because they're followers, they're, they're, you're not leading them. And then um, attitudes. Leaders who develop leaders want to let them go. They've got this great attitude. You want to turn people loose. You want to tell them what, I, I call it kind of the tight, loose, tight leadership. The tight is you need to tell people what the expectations are because nobody likes to work without expectations. The loose part is I don't care how you get there. I don't care how, as long as it's got integrity and we're not doing anything that's, that uh, is not right. And then here's the results that we need. And then you turn people loose. And you'll find that what happens is people immediately rise to the challenge. I went to a, um, when I first went to work for Walmart, they brought us into this, uh, I went in as loss prevention out of law enforcement. And so in loss prevention in the retail world, that's kind of the dark side, right? We're not out at the cash register selling you stuff. We're out there having you arrested for stealing out of the cash register. So nobody liked loss prevention, right? So we went into this massive warehouse and they took us through this, this really weird interview process. And so they sat us down and they gave us cans of Play-Doh, they gave us scissors, they gave us construction paper, they gave us tape. And then they put us in a group of about 15 people and then they stepped back and they said, you have one hour to develop the world's greatest mousetrap. And in one hour, you're gonna sell this mousetrap. And then they all stepped back from the table. So there we were, 15 or 20 of us, with about 15 or 20 HR and leadership people watching us. And what they were doing is they were trying to identify through this whole process, who would step forward, who kind of hung out in the back, who was probably the most vocal, who was the most timid, who was pushy, who was probably one of those leaders who wanted to develop followers, who would lead. And they were back there taking notes. And what was interesting was to watch people they were more nervous about the people watching than getting the project done. And then we finally finished the project and then to watch the wrangling that went on about who was gonna stand up and present the world's greatest mousetrap, right? Because nobody likes to get in front of people. And so this went on for about eight hours. And then they would come in and they'd hand us three by five cards with a word on it that I had never heard of, but it had some kind of a loss prevention term. They said, you have five minutes and we're gonna call you in a room and we need you to speak for four minutes on this word. And those were, when I first went to work for them, we didn't have iPhones, you didn't have Blackberry, we could go sneak and Google real fast. Nobody carried the encyclopedias, so we were in there. You had to really kind of think. So half of the stuff you prob I probably talked about had no idea what I was talking about. I just made up stuff. But um, they wanted to know really who had the ability to step forward. And then they set you down in front of a panel interview at the end of the day, and they fired questions at you back and forth. And some of the questions were were pretty tough. And then somebody didn't like what you'd say, so then they would always ask for a follow-up or they'd get a little aggressive. And then, at the end of the day, they said, well, thanks for coming, we'll let you know tomorrow. They didn't tell any of us, and there was a lot of us in there. So then I got the call the next morning to become one of their regional loss prevention people. And it was just interesting, though, going through that, because you immediately saw the people that probably didn't get the phone call, because they faded immediately. And then you saw the people that, as if you've ever been in a group, you're like, I would never work for this person, so I hope they don't get hired, right? Because there were a lot of those real pushy people. I, have, I didn't see a lot of the people that went through uh, at, after it was all over, but it was just an interesting event. So you've got to be able to encourage and connect and grow your people, and sometimes it takes funny, fun things to do with them 
to really develop them. And so as you think about becoming a leader, as you think about how you're going to get out of school and, and become the best that you want to be, you've got to mix it up. You've got to have a, a lot of fun with them. Um, the next thing is uh, leaders who develop leaders really want to spend time with people, and they want to grow the inside out instead of trying to get the outside to come in. Now, I've been on both ends of the sword. So I've been developed by great leaders who helped me move along in the organization, and then I've been brought in from the outside to come in. And I can tell you that the transition coming from the outside in is always some of the hardest things to do because people don't have trust. People think you're there to get their job. Uh, usually if you come in from the outside in, somebody's probably lost a job and now you're this person. And so there's a lot of time spent connecting with people, building integrity, building trust with them, where if you develop your people from the inside, they all say, well, I know that person. I would work for them any day. This is going to be exciting. Um, there's just a, a whole difference. So leaders who develop leaders really look at growing their people on the inside. And then there, there's an expectation. And leaders who develop leaders ask for commitments. And that's probably one of the biggest learnings that I've had in my leadership career is you can't manage people tight, loose, tight without asking for commitments. And so I was always the famous, hey, I need you to get this done. Oh, I got it done. And then all of a sudden, 10 days later, I'd come, and sure enough, it didn't get done. And how many of you have scrambled like when you had a group project and you were the only one that did the group project, right? Because everybody else was out having fun. Well, I was that kind of leader early on in my career. And I realized quickly that if you didn't have commitments and expectations with people, that you were going to be the one either picking up all the bad results that came out at the end. Because there's really only one person to blame at the end. And that is the leader that was leading. And so I would encourage you, you've got to set expectations as a leader, and then grow your people. And then lastly, you've got, to, you've got to have an impact on people, and you've got to think about everything beyond yourself. Because a self-absorbed leader really turns out to be one of those people you don't want to work for. Um, you've got to think about what's next. Kind of seeing the end from the beginning, if you could say, is how do you help your people see? And, and then as a leader, you have to see where you're headed and how the puzzle fits. And if you can't do that, if you only see today, then your team will only manage to today. And then they won't carry anything forward. And then all of a sudden, the company comes out with a new direction. And everybody's like, well, I didn't see this coming. And it's because we didn't ask you to look beyond today. We just kept you in today. So um, I ask you this question, and this is just something for you guys to think about, is really what shadow of leadership do you cast? And so could we truly see your handprint as a leader uh, on your project that you do? Um, I'm asked that a lot. We go in, we have executives come in, and they want to go see your locations. And so there's, there's nothing worse than having people fly in from far away. The only thing they've ever seen is your name and the numbers on a piece of paper. And they want to come see your locations, and they want to see your leaders that work for you. And they're always asking when we leave a store, could you see Jeff's shadow or handprint in this store? And the worst thing to get is the feedback that the team doesn't really, there's no example of your leadership within that building. But the, the most awesome thing is to have your team in the building exude so much positivity about how you lead them that when you leave, they're like, wow, we couldn't get his handprints out of there because they were just everywhere. So I asked you, what kind of a shadow do you want to lead as a, uh, leave as a leader? And if your shadow is positive, and if it changes people's lives, you're going to be a great leader. If your shadow is keeping people from growing, pe keeping people from achieving what they want, I can tell you that you'll succeed in certain areas of business. But eventually, there'll come that day of reckoning where people won't want to work for you. And then you'll be surprised when your turnover is high and you're telling your boss, I don't understand it. I don't know why nobody wants to work for me. And then you'll think through what really happened. So I think we have, how many? We're probably pretty close. OK. Um, so another funny story that I heard is um, a guy goes out golfing and he hits a golf ball and it lands on an anthill. And so he goes up to hit the ball again and takes one thing and hits the anthill and kills like 5,000 ants. 
Then he takes another strike, kills another 5,000 ants, and finally there's only two ants left, and they're like, hey, if we're going to get through this, we better get on the ball, right? So I would say to you, uh, as a leader, um, you, need to, you need to figure out what's killing the 5,000 ants and get on the ball and really figure out what are the attributes that you can pick up to be a great leader and get on the ball, because chances are um, you, you'll be very successful. Um, there's, there's really, I think, also, you need to look around as a leader and look around and see who are the people that are around you. Because the people around you make you either a better leader or a leader that nobody wants to follow. And so the old adage that your mom always said, choose your friends wisely. Choose who you work with wisely and who leads you wisely. Because you will become part of their shadow. And so soon your shadow could be casting what really that poor leader is casting when you're maybe not that person. But eventually, um, the retail world, or I would even say in any business world, the circles seem to get smaller and smaller. And soon you run into people. I've run into people that I remember first working at in Walmart after I made it through that interview process. And now they're off working somewhere, and they're in you know, a leadership position. And then all of a sudden, I'll be over here, and I'll run into somebody. And then I'll always run into somebody who I thought, I would never work for this person. And you run into them, and they've been hired by a company who has all kinds of problems, and they're a company you'd never want to work for anyways, and all of a sudden, there they are. You're like, I, I totally get it. I know why they're not successful, and I know why the company's not successful. So choose your friends or choose the people that you work with uh, wisely. Also, I would encourage you to take an hour a day and think about, think if you could take an hour a day for the next five years and work on your self-development as a leader. So an hour a day is not a, is not a lot of time, but at least an hour a day. And it could be broken up. You could be thinking about things in the car. You could be uh, you know, spending 15 minutes here. But an hour a day for the next five years, if you thought about where you wanted to go, what you wanted to do, and how successful you want to be, guaranteed within five years, you will, I hope, live up to what you've been wanting to be. Um, and if you're not, then maybe you need to, uh, to course correct a little bit. And the last thing I'll leave you is never be afraid of feedback from people. So I, um, I'm a person that likes people. So if somebody wants to tell me that I'm doing a bad job, I take that personally. Um, when in business, pe people, especially bosses that aren't fun to work for, always want to tell you what you're not doing right, right? So you have to be able to take feedback and process it, figure out how it applies, and then change either something in, in you. And I have, I have determined over the years that even though you disagree with the feedback when you first get it, if you think about it long enough, you'll find one or two things within that feedback that probably apply to what you're doing. Even if you cast out the 98% of all the stuff they wanted to tell you, there's probably one or 2% of things that you personally could probably change as a leader. And I guarantee you that if you seek feedback in real time, so it's not uncommon for me to go to one of my direct reports and say, what can I do to be a better leader for you? Or we stop customers all the time. It's always easy to go home and fill out a customer survey, right, and just blast the place. And most of my team never want to get real-time feedback from a customer, right, because you don't know what might happen. Okay, they had a bad experience or something. But we go out and we try to grab customers because we want to hear exactly how their experience was. We don't want them to go home and write a nasty note on the internet. We want to find out what they thought. Well, you need to do that as a leader with your people. You need to ask them, how can I be a better leader? And take their feedback. And what I've learned is that if you take one or two of the things that they ask you and you act on them and they see you act on them, you've now built that integrity and trust with your people and they will do anything you want. And I've, uh, the hardest feedback I ever got, which I also think was the funniest, was I had a boss that told me that he could never understand why people would work for me or they were so loyal to me and why I wouldn't leverage them to work even harder, at times probably even what I didn't believe in to do. So, and that was a bad boss I worked for and he couldn't figure out why I could build rapport and trust. So I can tell you that there's leaders out there that are just dying for people that can do the right thing, that can grow people, that can develop that rapport and trust because they're willing to turn the keys of the organization over to you 
and they're willing to help you be successful. And you would be surprised. I look back now at somebody where I started from and the blessings that I've been given to be able to do what I do, to earn what I do, to be able to have these kind of experiences have come. Because somebody back when I first started, and I can even name names of specific people who said, I'm going to help you get to wherever you want to go. And then I can name names of a couple people who said, you'll never do this, you'll never do that. And so had I listened to them, I wouldn't have the opportunities I have today. So I hope that um, if, you, if you'll take this last comment that I, that I wrote in here before we take some questions. If you lead through fear, you will have little to respect. But if you lead through respect, you will have little to fear. And so I, uh, I'll open it up if anyone has any questions at all. But I really appreciate it. I think... I think we, we don't spend enough time truly talking about what it is to be a great leader. We spend a lot of time, like I said, on weaknesses. And I think if you'll, um, a great book is uh, Discover Your Strengths, or Now to Go Discover Your Strengths. That's a great book. Um, I don't know the author, so I'm not endorsing it, but I would just say that um, it's a good book because it, you, can, you can take a little quiz and figure out where your strengths lie and then go after it. So any questions or anything? I know we're within a few minutes of needing to, to close down? Keep your questions to sure. Everybody's like... Why don't, you know what? Why don't you tell a little bit about your hiring? You have quite a few people that report. Mm -hmm. I don't think people quite know that. Tell a little bit about the, you know, kind of the scope of people that you have and especially the hiring and firing aspect. What makes the difference? So um, I work for Victoria's Secret, so that way... If, anybody's concerned that's I've limited brands owns us so um, you'd be amazed at the products we sell so um, most of you sisters would right so um, you'd also be amazed and I, I will only say this disclaimer for the company because I think I had a similar I had similar perspectives of the company before I actually joined the company and once you're behind the uh, behind the curtain could you say I would say that there are a number of of interesting and probably inappropriate things that the company do, does to attract certain individuals. But the true founding of the company and the founder, who is actually one of the, uh, the wealthiest uh, Jewish men in the country who actually does a lot for people in Israel, his belief was that he wanted to provide an opportunity for women, no matter what size, shape, if they've gone through breast cancer, if they've gone through anything, to feel good about themselves and wear something that they, you know, they could wear a bra that would make their self feel great. And I would say that in every aspect of our training, that is the base and the core of what we do. But I think the hardest thing to do is to hire great people. Because we hire a lot of, uh, a lot of times we have to train our people that we don't hire by the mirror test, meaning that we don't bring people in that want to work for us and we put the mirror up and if they breathe on it and we see like they have a breath, we like, you're hired, we're going to take you. Because most of those people work for us 90 days and then quit because then somebody else offers them 50 cents more down the road. And then we hire, and whatever ha usually what happens is if they don't get the other job offer because they probably couldn't get a job somewhere else, we end up having to fire them. And so I found that if you don't sit down and really talk through what the expectations of the role are, I've had to sit down with people and terminate their employment. And they act shocked that wait, I thought I was doing everything that you wanted me to do. And then I would have to step back. And I always force my leaders, before we ever terminate anybody, we have to ask one simple question. Do we do everything within our power to make sure that they were provided the support to be successful? And if we can say yes, then I'm, I'm like, then we have to do. And sometimes people make bad decisions, and you just got to do it. But if we at all stop and say, you know what? when we onboarded them, we failed to, to give them what they needed, then I'll have my team go back and identify what their job description is and determine what are the things that they feel like they need more training on. And then once we do that, then we feel satisfied. And I think that, that really protects our integrity as an organization and as a person, because we have tried to do what was right by the person first, and then if we have to, then we kind of sever. But we, um, I do a lot of interviewing. I let Probably uh, where I get into trouble, but I'm also most successful, this is my secret, is I hire great people, and then I let them hire great people. And I don't get in the middle of it. 
because I want them to own the people they bring on. I own the people that work directly for me. They own their people. So when there is a problem, I can sit down and say, you own them. What happened? Instead of them saying, Jeff, you're the one that signed off on them. You own them. And so I let them hire great people, and I hire great people. And then I love to send people outside of my area. So I'm constantly networking with, even if it's, even if they want to go to work for Old Navy, and I, I know people there, if I get a call from somebody I know and they say, we're looking for somebody amazing, and I know somebody in my organization will probably not get to where they want to go because they've either, they don't want to move, the time, there's a five-year timeline, I will, I will call that person and say, hey, I don't want to lose you, but here's a great opportunity for you. Because I believe that if you do what's right with people and it's right for them, right for their family, right for them personally, it always comes back to you because you'll find that they'll either attract somebody to your organization or I actually may run into them 10 years from now and I may be working for them. And so it's just about building people. We're all doing the same thing. Um, and then you build that loyalty to leaders. So that's kind of the, I would say that the hiring, the, the people, leadership is people, and sometimes people really stink, right? And sometimes people are awesome and um, you kind of pick and choose you're the one that almost does it to yourself when you're dealing with poor performers. So there's nothing worse than having to sit down and talk to somebody about their performance when you haven't given any expectations. Um, that's the worst thing that could happen. What else? Anybody have any questions or? Go ahead. So she asked, like, if you're working for somebody that wants to develop followers and you realize it. Um, so I, I've always told myself and, the, and people that I've hired is know your job so well that you're irreplaceable first and then develop people that are working directly for you. And what I found is that if you're working for somebody that's a poor leader, you will find, and don't get discouraged, but guaranteed when something great happens, they're the ones that take the credit. It happens every time, right? And so you sit back there and you're like, yeah, but I'm the one that just did that project. I'm the one that made that decision and made that extra million dollars for the company. And what I tried to do is develop my leadership with those that work for me so that I had the opportunity when called upon to kind of shine. So that decision that might have been made that made that extra million dollars when I get that opportunity to travel with executives, you have the opportunity to influence people. And it's all about influencing. But then ultimately, I've also recognized that I'm not a fit for the organization. And so I started going out and looking for another organization where I felt like I would fit. But then what I did is I went to people that I truly trusted and believed in and asked for their opinion on whether or not they thought I would fit in an organization. Because there's nothing worse, because people, when you interview for a job, sometimes will tell you everything that you want to hear, but they never tell you about the 80 hours a week and the seven days a week and never being home and all those kind of things until you're in it. And then you're like, oh my, I had this, I thought a bad job, but that was really better than what I'm in. So you got to go to the people that you trust. And so if, if you really feel like you can't grow anymore, I would encourage you to then go to people that you trust but then ultimately make the decision yourself and say, I think I can do this. And you would be surprised. Um, what I've been able to do has been just because when I'm asked to do something, I do it. And I will do it the best I can. And people, people actually respect you for doing what's right. And that's how I've been successful. So we, we talked a little bit about, uh, so he's asking, how do you identify the top 20 and the bottom 20? So we, to get kind of analytical on it, we would kind of do a spreadsheet that really identified results as well as leadership behaviors. And then we would kind of sit down and do a ranking based off of results. And then we would also get input from who they work for to identify. And what's interesting is the bottom 20 are pretty quick to identify. I always ask my team when I sit down, I say, 
who is your number one associate? And they'd be like, oh, well, it's you know, John. He's amazing. And then I'd say, so anybody you hire from now on has to be a John. And um, we always used, uh, in our family, was we had this uh, goofy story about this girl that my kids dated. So all the girls that they dated, we would compare to her. So whenever they'd come over and after the girl was gone, we'd say, well, is she as good as so-and-so? And if they said no, then we would be like, well, that may not be the right place to go. So I use that in business now. I say, hey, are they, are they as good as this person? And if they're not, we don't hire. Or if they're already with the organization, those are the people that you have those direct con um, conversations with. And I think that's the other hard thing is I learned a long time ago as a policeman, you can have a direct conversation with somebody. You're going to jail. What are you gonna, what are you gonna do? You, know, you can run, you can fight, whatever, but we do that too, so we'll go with you and all that'll happen. But in the real life, when you sit down with somebody and say you're a bad performer, you've gotta be direct about it, but if you're not actually caring about it, there's nothing you can do. You know, uh, the person will love to kind of battle wits with you if you don't have your preparation. So the bottom 20 always seem to come up, and those are the people you have the direct conversation with and say, you know what, you may not be fitting the organization. What is it that you think you'd like to do? And then we help them kind of go. And some of them do so many blatant things that they actually kind of open themselves up. You say, they're always late, they always call in sick, they always, there's just something that happens. And it's amazing what people do to themselves. So I always tell the team, they're going to do something. Um, so either we act now or something will happen, and then we'll have to act. So you choose the day, but we really have to do it. And I spend a lot of time coaching my people, because you would be surprised how many people have a hard time having a direct conversation, a performance coaching with somebody, because they don't want to hurt their feelings. And ultimately, they soften it a little bit. And then when somebody comes along, that really tells it like it is, that person is caught unaware because they're like, well, but Jeff told me I was okay, and now you're telling me I'm really bad? What, you know, there's just all this disparity between that. So they, the top 20 always rise up, so.